Bonjour. 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 Uh, I have the, the task of talking about heat control on hens right after we just ate. It's going to be pretty daunting to be able to go through it, but I'm going to try to do my best. Thank you for allowing me to come up and be a part of this. We're going to talk about the plan um, of, the, of the presentation, and it's talking about identifying the heat release, the science behind the heat release, the cause and effect of it, and then how do we solve the problem with releasing the hens, the heat off of the hens. So let's talk about heat release first. So one thing we know is in hens that they consume about 264 calories per kilogram of body weight. Humans consume about 55 calories per kilogram of body weight. So when we start to look at it and how much heat's being produced, here's what we kind of need to understand. In a broiler at the bottom, they roughly use 25% of the calories consumed for maintenance and growth. The other 75% of the calorie production is released in heat. So in an example that was given to me is very similar to a vehicle. When you're driving your vehicle and you put petrol in and you use a liter of petrol, 25% of that petrol is used to operate the vehicle, to move it forward, to use the electronics, and to control. The other 75% of that liter of petrol is burned out in excess heat. Goes out through the muffler, goes through the radiator, and is exhausted through the engine heat. That is a common everyday example in poultry today. <coughs> So here are some numbers, not very scientific, but I can prove them. Hens consume about five and a half ounces of feed per feeding, roughly. And that's if they're at peak, 30 weeks old, and they're at seven pounds, 7.8 pounds. That's how much feed they're gonna consume. That's about 7% of their body weight they're gonna consume every morning. This is where it gets very scientific. Wikipedia says the average Canadian weighs about 83 kilograms or 177 pounds. That's the average male Canadian. Wikipedia does not have a weight <laughs> for the females. Very scientific, I said. <clears throat> so that's the equivalent for a male. We do not know for the female. That is the equivalent for the male of eating 5.6 kilograms of food in one feeding. Or the equivalent of four pizzas or 33 Big Macs in one feeding. Can you imagine the heat release that we would do if we consumed all those calories all at one time? So we have to look at the way that the heat is being released in the hen and how can we go about getting the heat off of the hen here's an example from the university of georgia that talks about the heat release that's being used um, and the more the wind speed the better we can be able to cool the bird and use the wind speed and respiration to our advantage when we start looking at internal body temperatures of these hens we start seeing 43 degrees, 42 degrees, 43 degrees, 43. These hens are extremely hot when we take the time to watch them after they consume feed. The majority of the managers and the growers make sure that feed is presented through the house and then they move on. If we look at the hen an hour or two hours after she consumes the feed, we start to see the effects and how we need to help. So I'm gonna show you several thermal imaging pictures throughout this presentation. I wanna show you a little bit about the image and what it's saying so that as we go through the presentation, we'll be able to see 
and make your own interpretations. When you look at the side of each picture, you'll see a bar graph, and the hotter or the yellower the color, the hotter the temperature, and the bluer the color, the cooler the temperature. So on this pullet that's about 13 days old, you can see where she's releasing the heat, but you can also see the feathers that's creating a type of insulation. So anytime that you see a feather, anytime that you see feathers, you can pretty much say that that is the ideal or that is the ambionic temperature of the house. When we look at eggs, you can see the eggs that are fertile and going through embryonic stages. And we can also see eggs that are not fertile. They're not using any embryonic heat. So let's look at it a little bit closer. When we look at a, a hen house, we can see the nest. We can see the scratch areas. Look how much heat these hens are putting off. It's critical to understand it when we see it with the thermal image versus the naked eye because they are releasing so much body heat. And a little bit, your eyes will start to get closed because you will start to get tired because your body is using metabolic energy in order to eat or in order to consume what we had for lunch. So let's look at hens as they're feeding a couple hours after they feed because remember, they go to feed they go to water, and then they go to the nest. So here's what it looks like. Fingers. Feeding, waters, and into the nest. So here's what it should like, and here's what it shouldn't look like. We have a good picture. All the hens are in the nest. They're content. You can tell by the picture. They're not hot. They're in every nest hole. We get into a situation where these hens are hot and they're in the nest, but they're sticking their heads out of it because if you notice on these thermal imaging, these hens have three ways to release heat. One of it is their head, the other one is the wings, and then the last one is the legs. And so you can see in this picture here they're putting their head up above the nest because they're hot. And then we can see, and in this other picture here as well, she's extremely hot, and she's so hot that the nest beside her, they're hot as well, and the hens don't even want to go to the hole. What ends up happening? Floor eggs, non-nest eggs. That's what ends up happening when we're not able to cool this hen down enough to be able to capture the eggs. We have to understand some of the problem. Some of the problem is actually the nest itself. And so we're getting newer designs. We're allowing more air to get into the nest. We're using better designs to have holes inside in between the nest. And so we're doing better as a manufacturing standpoint in order to help get the air through the nest itself. But we still have problems. We still have the older nest. And the older nest will take the temperature at 81 degrees and we take another temperature right beside it and the hen's not in it. We take another nest and we see that they're 89 degrees and she's hot, she's hot, she's hot. They're being forced into the nest even though they don't want to be. And the other ones are probably being laid nest out on the slats. So this is a video I took um, probably about four months ago in the States. These pullets are 17 or 18 weeks old, if I remember right. We have just feeding the birds, as you can tell. That's the feed motor down there. You can see it, another one right here. And you can see these birds just constantly, just nothing, but just releasing heat, releasing heat. This is while the actual feed is being out and being placed. So I'm going to show you a couple images later about what actually it looks like when we slow it down. Remember, every time that we do something, we're trying to replicate the mother. We've got to be able to create that environment. So 
how does the bird release the heat? So there's two major ways that it does it, and it's sensible heat and latent heat through respiration and through body temperature. It's pretty simple. We're looking at 15 BTUs per hour per kilogram and 11 BTUs on the sensible heat. There's a lot of heat being produced off these birds. Two methods to remove the heat. It's not, it's not too incredibly scientific. It's not like the presentation we heard earlier about the um, artificial intelligence. We can do it one of two ways. We can do it with the air inside the chicken house or we can pull air through the chicken house and create a greater temperature differential with more wind speed. So when do we see effective cooling? When do we know that we're doing the right thing for the bird and how can we visually understand it? When we look at this chicken here with the thermal image, we look at this hen, we can see that she's cooler on one side and she's warmer on the other side. She's cooler on one side because we're bringing air down the house and it's cooling her on one side and then the air is going over and moving on down towards the fans at the very end. So we can see that this is really good cooling because from the thermal image, she's cool on one side and warm on the other. So what is the cause and effect? So I'm going to show you a series of six pictures that were taken. This first picture is when the pullets are actually being fed. So when you look down the chain, you can see the feed that's come into the house at a cooler temperature, and it's coming down at a rapid speed, and you can see the hens are just waiting in order for them to be able to grab the feed when they can. We can see now that we've stopped the chain. You can see all the cold feed that's come in in the trough, and that is about right after we stop the chain. We look at it at an hour later, and we can see that some of the feed is still in the track. But look at the difference in the birds. Look how much warmer, look at the hotter color that we're starting to see just one hour after we've ran the feed. What does it look like two hours after we've ran the feed? Look at the difference. You can see the feed is clearly gone. They've consumed all the feed. Now they're getting water and going out their daily thing Six hours later, feed's been digested, and then you look at the different color of the bird. So you start to see more blues where they're cooler, and the only thing now that's red is their heads. So let's look at that one more time. Bird's being fed. Change stops. Look at the color of the red. The, she's even hotter. She's even hotter. And then she finally starts to cool down six hours later. Thankfully, luckily, a couple hours after that, what are we going to do with the pullet? We're going to put her down for the night. So she's able to release that body heat before we go when we put her down for the rest of the day. Sometimes there's more than meets the eye when we see a feeding that's gone bad. We see a problem with the motor. We've not turned it on at the right time. Grower overslept, some type of manufacturing or malfunction in the equipment. This is what it looks like from the thermal side. You can see all the heat build up here and there's nothing there at all. So what do we need to do and how do we need to manage that heat? Well, in the winter time up here in Canada, it's a little bit different. We have all this heat up here. We've got air that needs to come in. We've got to be careful that it doesn't go straight on to the birds. We, how do we go back and do we recapture some of that heat? Ideally, you would like to see some air come in and recapture some of this heat and then be able to reuse it so we don't take all the heat out of our hen houses and it stay cool for the rest of the day. We've got to be careful that we don't take all the heat out of the house. We need to be smart and be efficient bring the air in from the right ways so that we don't cause the house to be too cool. Here's another video of, of some houses that are 
going through the feeding operation and you can see that there are four fans in this particular house fan number one two three and four all four houses all three of the four fans are actually moving air one of them is completely off fan number one is completely off but look at fan number four is it doing much of is it pulling much heat out of the house not much at all is it you can see the motors running motors right there you can see it running fairly well but it's just not extracting as much heat as the other one so how does heat and heat stress affect fertility it, ex it affects fertility more in the males and can be up to 15 percent during the summer months it doesn't take a whole lot of heat in order to affect the male in fact some studies have shown that at 27 degrees it can decrease the fertility in the male it doesn't have to be just the mortality of the male that causes fertility it can be the panting stress as well how do we solve it how do we prevent it you maintain a good ideal house temperature you plenty of cool water to drink um, you can use cool cells and make sure that we're feeding early in the morning <clears throat> so the solution how do we solve getting the heat off of these hens in order to help us in production We're moving further and further into the 20th century, the 21st century. We can use electronics and controllers in order to automate and control how we turn these fans on. The modern controllers are doing an excellent job where we can drop the temperature down 8, 9, 10, 11 degrees below our target during the period of time that we need in order for this heat to be released off the birds. <coughs> We can use it manually with a light clot and a thermostat. We've been doing that for decades. We need to monitor the house temperature to make sure that we're not removing too much heat, like I said earlier. And we have to understand that if we get rid of the heat, that it improves our hen mortality, it improves our feed intake, which improves uniformity, and it helps reduce slat eggs and floor eggs. We're going to talk about where the wind speed is the fastest inside of a house so we understand why the floor eggs are laid like they are. It's great to have nice, tight houses. It's really great to have this. And, and what I notice in my travels in Canada is you guys do a great job of taking care of your barns. In the U.S., we, in the States, we don't do a very good job. You guys do a, such a better job. You also have a little bit more invested, too. Financially, we don't have as much invested as you guys do. And we tend to see a little bit more of curtain-sided houses, and we're just now transitioning into solid wall houses in the U.S. as to where you have guys been doing that for years. So what's the alternative? This is common in the U.S. A curtain-sided house with a whole bunch of leaks and a lot of cold air coming in, coming in at the wrong places. You see the air dropping, air coming across the slats. And like I said, the, the technology is increasing, and, and as the younger generation comes along in farming and as the younger generation comes along to help you with feed and chicks, what you'll start to see is us embracing technology even more. You can see these controllers have cool-down programs set in place. You turn them on. You start to say, how many degrees do I want off? what time and what time period, how much time do I want it to run after feeding. You can run this rotom a little bit different. You could tell it from the exact time and the exact temperature. It's great to be able to use that technology if we know what we're looking for, but we've got to be able to know that she's hot and when she's hot and when do we need to run the right air. So as we look at barns being built up here um, with some tunnel ventilation, we have to understand what the air is actually doing inside the house. I've often said that air is a lot like water. If you have a roof leak and the roof is leaking here in your kitchen, does that mean that that's where the nail is in the roof under, through the shingle? No, it could be way over somewhere else. Air is very similar. 
University of Georgia has done a study, and what we're looking at is the bluest area is 640 feet per minute, and so that's the area where, right around our feed hoppers, right? A lot of restriction, a lot of air moving around the feed hoppers and creating where our meters are a higher wind speed. You can also see 200 feet per minute or 280 feet per minute, and we see that up at the very front. Your cool cells or your openings for your tunnel is up here, and your tunnel fans are back here in the very back. And we can see here that where our chickens are eating on the slats in a normal U.S. model, the air is not that fast. But in the center of the house, you can see a lot of wind speed be coming down the house because the air travels the path of least resistance. The biggest challenge that we have in our model versus some of you having your nest in the center of the house is we don't pull a lot of wind speed where actually the birds are. So we have to understand that uh, most breeder houses, the air velocities near the sidewall are typically about a half of what they are in the center of the house. And that we need to use that velocity in order to, to have an understanding of where we need to set these controllers. So as we look at it and we start to see the cross-sectional area of the house, where this would be a sidewall, and this would be your sidewall, and this being the center of the house, you can see that Georgia has said that when we turn on more fans, we get more wind speed in the center of the house. But again, here lies the problem. Our hens are eating over to the sides, and so they're eating over here. And so if you just add another fan, it doesn't mean that it solves the problem because we go from adding one fan or a fan, six fans, seven fans, eight fans, and nine fans. If we add another fan, it's always not always the case where it solves the problem. Tunnel doors are a great option able to bring the air in, move the air around, create a good area up in the front of the chicken house, and it does a better job of distributing the air from the very end all the way up to the front wall. Tunnel doors are great insulators. Another big key with cooling houses down, especially in breeder hens, we're keeping them 40, 42, 45 weeks, is just having good maintenance on fans. Fans that run inefficiently versus fans that run more efficiently. We can use our controllers and our electronics to be able to rotate fans and use different fans so that we're not just wearing one fan out constantly. The picture doesn't show up really that well, and I apologize about the picture. But in this, you can see that we've got all four fans going and this fan is very, barely pulling any heat out of the house. This fan's doing a little bit better job. This fan is doing a little bit better job than these two. This fan's doing the best. If we don't go down there and look at the very end of the chicken house, we just see four fans that are rotating, and we think it's doing a good job. However, our thermal image tells us we've got some inefficient fans that's leaving some heat inside the house. I think the cool down would be a whole lot easier if we had brand new fans. But we can't always afford brand new fans. This is an excellent design where you've got the community nest in the middle, your feeders up here. We're able to bring the air across and bring it to exactly where we need it to be. So in conclusion, the thermal comfort level of the hen is very important to relieve the stress, to help our hatch, to help non-nest eggs to be able to collect those, sudden death syndromes, and so much more in fertility. Cool down is very critical to achieve the comfort level of the bird. Again, if we've got to understand that it's not when we feed, it's an hour, two, and three hours after we feed when we see that hen getting stressed out and not wanting to go into the nest. Understanding how much heat there really is is half the battle. 
being able to see a thermal image and know what's going on with her. And she's completely different. When she comes into the house and she's 21, 20 weeks old, and she's got a full feathers and she looks great, that's one thing. When she's 60 weeks old and we don't have a whole lot of feathers, the air is completely different on her because she doesn't have as much plumage. So we have to understand how the heat is being released off her, and that's the majority of the battle. And being able to do it and apply it is very critical because oftentimes what we think air does, it doesn't do. We have to understand how the air enters the house and removes the heat off of the hen. I guess now is the time for questions. Est-ce que nous avons des questions en français ou en anglais à votre discrétion? Moi, je, oui. Je vais vous donner le micro. Thank you. Tu vas, tu vas te traduire. Bon, on est une compagnie de transport. On transporte de la volaille. Puis, euh, moi, j'aimerais ça savoir, euh, tu sais, on vient de parler du, du stress thermique, mettons, en hiver, là, bon, quand les poules ont mangé. Euh, il devrait être transporté après combien d'heures de jeûne afin de faciliter la température, afin qu'il ne fasse pas trop chaud dans le voyage, diminuer l'humidité? How long will it be and how long is the transport before? I would say probably four to six hours, Benoit. Okay. Four to six hours. D'autres questions? Any questions? Merci. So, merci, uh, Scott. Donc, je vais donc inviter Benoît Lantier à remettre un prix à M. Uh, Scott pour le remercier de sa présentation. Donc, merci. Thank you.